I'm ready to start. Um, hello, my name is uh, George Stallings. I've been a club member since uh, I think like 2016 or so. I kind of lurk around. I don't really come to meetings that much, uh, but I, uh, I do uh, participate sort of in a background. Uh, I mostly do planetary imaging. Uh, that's sort of my thing. Uh, growing up in a city for the most part and lived in cities or nearby. Uh, dark sky stuff has been mostly inaccessible until recently. Um, anyway, I started uh, 3D printing. Uh, I got my first 3D printer in May, um, and I started designing things, I guess, around June. So I'm not exactly uh, experienced when it comes to it, but uh, I, I do enjoy trying things out. Um, I'm getting a little more proficient at uh, uh, Fusion 360. Um, I, I took the plunge with uh, Simplify 3D a uh, couple months back. Um, I've been using, I had been using Flash Print. Uh, I have a Flash Forge printer. Um, I've done, I've printed some astronomy things, uh, designed a desiccant holder to stick inside um, my C6 and actually C8 and C9 and a quarter as well. So it's a tube that goes through the baffle. Um, and it, and uh, it actually tightens down um, uh, through the uh, the rear uh, the rear cell so that it, it stays in. Um, I printed uh, what else have I printed? Uh, oh, I printed a, 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 a also a, I made a dew shield for my finder scopes. Uh, I've made some end caps uh, caps for finder scopes uh, that I've lost uh, for which. I keep losing them, so I print it like fit when I when I found the size that worked, I printed like 20 of them. Um, so that you know, when I lose them, I'll still have some in sort of in reserve. Um, and there are some other things as well. I printed rings for my um Explore Scientific uh ED80, um, which was uh the finder, the basically the the um the do dovetail that comes with it, it's sort of lacking so i wanted to put rings on it so do you have other um, things they're small that you hold up and show um actually i have with me i do have some stuff downstairs uh we had our drywall done last night so things were moved but um i do have uh one thing that i'll be showing you how i did tonight and actually that is um this is the um the apollo 15. Yes, uh, Apollo 15 landing site. Hadley Rill. Hadley Rill. And though you might be able to see it here, there's the rill. Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry to get the correct orientation here. Yeah, so this is Mons Hadley. Um, I actually spray painted it gray. It's, uh, so yeah, it's a pretty, that's, Bill, that was awesome that you found that, that you knew that that quickly from looking at it. Did you know I had the topic? A few of it last month. So, Oh, okay. I memorized it to, you know, make sure I was seeing the right thing. Yeah. So <laughs> that's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, so that's exactly what that is. So actually, I printed this off um, from uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Data, and I'm going to show you guys how to do that tonight. Um, it's actually really easy. Um, you literally don't have to do much um, at all other than pick out your target. Um, I think the most difficult part of it really is kind of knowing which target to pick. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, share my screen with you guys, um, if you don't mind, and I will walk you through the steps that I that I took to create that print, and you can use mm -hmm. to create your own prints for um, not just actually the moon, but you can actually do this with Earth features as well, just not with LROC data. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I'm going to present now, pick my screen, there we go. Okay, does everyone see a lunar map? Okay. So, uh, this is um, this is a uh, University of Arizona uh, lunar reconnaissance um, program, um, basically imagery. Uh, it's a map. It's from LROC. 
Um, you can scroll around the moon to sort of pick your data points to see where you, you know, would like to focus it on. It's actually a great resource in general. Um, okay. It's a great resource in general. So um, I'm going to go directly to the Hadley Real Area now. And the great thing with this is that you can... Pick your area. So you can search for products once you do that. So for this, we do 3D printing. Now it gives you a view of what your model would look like. Now, um, I'm going to get a little bit into vertical exaggeration, particularly. Um, so I've found that for smaller areas, some vertical exaggeration um, is definitely more pleasing to the view, um, particularly for larger areas. The smaller the area, the less it's really necessary. Uh, but it sort of allows for um, just a more contrast between the different elevation areas. Um, and then once you sort of like your vertical exaggeration, you can go too far with it, by the way, I'll show you. So, you know, if you go up to like seven, it's sort of, it's obviously ridiculous. Um, so, you know, two to three, I think max is sort of where you want to live with that. Um, and then from there, you can call this whatever you want. Just call it a Hadley three. It's like build. So what it does is it sends you a zip file, which you can extract. I will. Now, uh, the zip file will give you a, if you have a Windows computer, um, Windows does come with a sort of 3D builder. You can take a look at the model itself. Um, but one thing you will get a sense of is the scale of this is actually huge. And it's not something that I figured out, not really figured out how to change that. Um, but it really hasn't been necessary, and I'll show you. Um, it hasn't been necessary to do much about that. So what are these files called, George? Uh, these are called STL files. Um, STL? Yes. And um, basically, it's uh, STL files are 3D printable files. Um, I, this is based on altimeter data. Um, but you could download STL files for you know, a bunch of other things. STL files are not just for um, geographic data, for example. So um, I have STL files, for example, for um, you know, this is a sanding stick to sand models, for example, that I 3D print. And you can put uh, sandpaper within them. Um, so STL files come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, for a variety of different kinds of things. Um, in our case, though, we will be using STL files for printing up a lunar uh, map. And so now um, I use both FlashPrint and, Sim and uh, Simplify 3D 
Um, this will work really with any slicer you use. Um, so I'm going to show you an example with, uh, this is the slicer, this slicer here, this is flash print. This came with my printer and this here is uh, Simplify 3D. So in Simplify 3D, what happens when you try to open, um, Hmm. Try something else. Sorry, I'm having a technical. So what happens when you open these files is that the scale is actually massive. Um, so you actually have to scale it down. Um, and they for they need to be repaired um, on flash print, and I suspect that will be the case for pretty much everyone. Um, but I'm not sure why that is. I don't know enough about how these files work yet to know why that fix needs to happen. But it actually doesn't really affect. Print. Yeah, massive means what? Uh, terabytes? Um, no, sorry, in actual scale. So the scale of the, like right now, the item, I had to scale this down to um, about four by, this is actually probably about, um, it's probably about four by six inches or so. No, no, actually it's a square. So this would be what's 150. So this is 150 by 150 millimeters. Um, this actually scales up into meters, um, the file it sends you. So you have to really scale it down. Um, so that you can actually print it in a printer um, that most people would own. Um, if you have like an industrial printer, um, that's one thing. But um, the largest thing that I can print um, is about nine inches wide and um, six inches high. Um, and so this is the STL file as it comes out. Um, well, the actual area on the moon is whatever 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers so it yes you that act that scale yes so uh the <laughs> and i'm actually going to get into that so what happens um when you choose an area is that you know it'll send you the file to print um print settings are you know you, you can play with them on your on your own um with my individual print, I actually did a relatively high layer area that I normally do just to speed up the print. Um, basically, the the thickness of the layers that the printer prints out um, because it builds us up in layers. Um, so I did relatively thick layers just to keep the speed on this up, you know, basically so that I can print this within a few hours. I think I printed this in about four and a half hours or so. Um, and you can actually i'm going to open this try to open this again simplify 3d uh new you had to buy the software george so um windows. this software came with windows huh, i don't know why it's not opening all right well, I well get let, it. let me see if i honest i think i understand that there are is software to actually run the printer. Yes. So and if you this, want to do a design, a, a cylinder or a box, you need uh, design software that's separate. Yes. Right? So design software is separate. So the software you're seeing right here, for example, this is this was free. This actually came with my computer or sorry, not my computer, my printer. Um, you can download um, a, a lot of printers do come with their own software. Um, you can also download, there are free, uh, they call them slicers. Um, there's, there's free slicing uh, programs that you can use as well. Um, this is just something that comes with my printer. 
uh, but STL files, any slicing software, free or paid, um, will allow you to open these STL files typically. Um, and then you scale you, you scale it down the size so that you can set it up for printing. Now on, on again, your printer settings, it really depends on what you want the um, object to look like. So, you know, you may get a better quality print with a slow setting or printing printing the object more slowly with thin layer heights. Um, and so in that case, um, you know, in my case, your layer height is, you know, here and you can select this printing or you can, you can select, you know, this levels, you can go down below point, uh, point 0.1 millimeter. Um, I, I don't know how effective that is. Um, if eventually you just run out of resolution. Um, it's just not going to get any better um, with a smaller layer height. Uh, print speed is important as well for accuracy. Um, if you want more accurate prints, you lower the print speed. Uh, your temperature, that really depends on your printer settings. So, you know, for me, I found that I've, you know, my extruder temperature at 200 is good for all PLAs for the most part. Um, but my platform temperature, um, sort of the default setting on my printer is 50 degrees Celsius. I found that to really not work well. <laughs> um, so in general, I set it to 70 degrees Celsius and I've had much better prints since then. Um, and, you know, it, you don't, you know, this example here is Hadley Real, but um, I've actually done, uh, let's see, other projects as well. So... Let's see, I did Copernicus. So this here is Copernicus. Um, and Copernicus is this actually, um, this, go ahead, yeah. Okay. Um, Copernicus itself is, um, it, it's, it's a knee crater. Um, and I thought it would be a great thing to print, and I did print this. Uh, but the problem with um, Copernicus is its size, um, which is why I went to Hadley Rill. Um, Copernicus, you know, you know, this is covering, you know, this crater itself is, you know, over, this is over 100 kilometers, basically, uh, when you're counting the ejecta here. And the issue is that, you know, at this scale, the resolution of your printer becomes a problem. So, um what I find fascinating about Copernicus actually are the secondary craters from its ejecta blanket. Um, for me, you know, I think that's one of the more interesting aspects of it, as well as the uh, uh, central peaks inside of the crater itself. Um, these actually, this actually does not print well. Um, it looks okay, you know, resolution-wise. The issue is that these small craters become difficult to see. Um, so. Your best bet with lunar, you know, geographic models for a typical printer, if you're only going to print one plate, is that you have to keep these areas relatively small, um, or you have to use a lot of vertical exaggeration, which doesn't look as natural. Um, so I'm pretty sure Copernicus here. This is a two or three vertical exaggeration. Um, anything more than that, it starts looking unnatural. Um, and the print quality of this, while again, the quality was great, um, the resolution was relatively low. So a lot of these craterlets, even though you can see them if you look really closely, they just don't stand out. Um, so something with something like Hadley, um, you can get a lot more vertical exaggeration, um, natural vertical exaggeration within a smaller area. Um, now, another thing you can do with these prints as well, and this is going back to the LROC page, is that you can have um, multiple pieces. So there are two ways you can achieve higher resolution. Um, you can do a small area, or you can build this out in four individual pieces. Um, and so what that effectively does is, it, you know, you're basically... Um, you're you're increasing the size of your print, um, but you're allowing smaller details to be printed um, at the resolution that your printer is capable of printing. Um, so, you know, if you do want to do a larger area, you can. You just have to do it in. You know, this gives you the option of four pieces. However, you can actually cut this 
um, you can download as a single piece. And then within your slicer, um, you can actually cut models. So in my case, for example, if I wanted to cut this, um, you know, I can draw it with a mouse. Okay, sorry. And then, uh, no. You can then slice, um, you can then join these later if you'd like, or you can, um, you know, if you'd like, you can join these later anyhow you want. You can glue it together, you can do anything. But if you want a large print, um, one thing you can do is download a single STL file and then cut that file in pieces um, and then print out individual pieces that work. Um, for me, that's a little too painstaking, but it's a possibility um, as well. Hey, George. Yes. I had one question um, I, I saw yesterday when I meant to ask you. There apparently yeah. are some changing per, um, perspectives there. Um, I saw that. Have you played with that? Um, so I, I have a little, um, let's see here. Wait a sec. Oh, for, sorry for the print. Let me go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, um, so yeah, you get orthographic and I haven't played with this, but I mean, we can see what happens if you like, I don't know. If it's... Well, I was wondering if that would make more sense for, um, Copernicus, for example. Huh. I don't know. We can give it a try actually. The, the, the fact that you can just move the moon around and find where you want to be tells me you've been doing this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to make maps for a living. Um, it's sort of a, it, it's sort of a skill. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a big fan of the moon. So, um, So normally I've been using perspective. Yeah, that actually looks worse. <laughs> Maybe it isn't, but it looks worse. Yeah. Well, let's we'll see. George, if you do a, a series of pieces, how well do they fit together <laughs> so in theory they fit together perfectly um yeah. in practice what happens is it really depends on um it depends on a number of factors such as um how well the object um how well your your print came out um so you know the cuts themselves are really accurate um i i've cut things down I printed something out for a club member um, where I actually cut parts of an of another model off. Um, and I was slicing it down to fractions of a millimeter. So it, in the case that I wanted to join them back together, those pieces, it would have probably worked perfectly. Um, however, on a complex model like topography, I I think you... If you look closely, you would definitely see the fact that you would cut it in sections, at least with my printer and my printing capabilities. Um, you know, variations in temperature. Um, there are basically a lot of variables that can happen that can affect print quality, where on a single model, it really wouldn't matter. Um, you know, it still looks great. But when you're looking for uniformity, you may run into some issues. Um, and it's not just with, you know, your settings can be all the same, but you can come, you know, if you changed filament, for example, you could have a, your batch of filament could be chemically slightly just a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I've had, you know, I tend to use the same filament, uh, for example, but 
um, I know that like the filament I'm using right now or that, that I have, it's not loaded, but that I have in my desiccant box, um, it's been a, a little bit more sensitive to temperature. I'm not sure why, maybe it got, maybe it had water in it somehow, you know, or maybe it's just a little bit more damp, but I mean, even though the humidity in the, in the dry box is pretty good, um, you know, there are just factors that change how print quality comes out. So, you know, I, I think for most purposes, it would look fine. Now, um, with this print, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second. Um, uh, let's sort of figure out how to do that. Da, 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 da. So with this print, um, I'll try and get as close as I can. Um, you may be able to see some detail of basically the layers that went into creating mountains. Um, and you know those details are small, but you may or you may not even see them. Um, but um, you know things like that, those layer heights and how they print, that changes with each. You know, with small changes in temperature or humidity. Um, you know, I think with this print, I actually spray print, uh, spray printed it or spray painted it. Um, so you know, minor imperfections are actually kind of covered up in this. There really weren't many. This was actually a really good print. Uh, but um, actually, one neat thing I did want to show you guys with this is that you can actually see the details. Um, so when you download the STL file, it actually gives you information about the area that you selected. Um, so it gives you um, your central coordinates. Uh, it also gives you your minimum and maximum uh, elevation heights uh, based on uh, basic um, the lunar um, uh, it's not table. Um, it's, it's not their sea level, but it's their it's their uh, datum that they use for basically sea level. Um, it also tells you uh, your kilometer area. So this is sixty nine point sixty nine uh, kilometers. Actually, seventy point seventy kilometers almost. And actually, the website uh, of the company that um, uh, meta, or creates the STL files that you download. Um, so. Um, I've done a couple of these. I've done Copernicus and this. Um, I've also done, um, I did a mountain range in Italy. Um, and I was looking at another mountain range in England um, to print out. Uh, again, these are pretty small areas, but they do make kind of neat maps. Um, I spray painted this gray. Um, I actually did buy gray filament with the idea that I would reprint this or some other area of the moon, but I actually liked the spray paint. I actually liked the spray paint better. Um, than the print itself. I think it just gives it a nice like little patina over the top that I think is more natural looking to most people. So, yeah, that was my next question: whether you could paint over. Yeah. yeah. So I got Krylon. Uh, I think they call it like Krylon, like it's a chalk, or they call it chalk. Um, I, I guess the it's basically. Um, it's kind of a, it's a flatter paint. It's not quite as uh, glossy um, or matte, I guess you could put it. Um, uh, but yeah, basically it's it's not glossy. Um, so this this spray paint itself, um, you know, it, it works for this model. Some people might like something that's glossy. Um, this isn't, again, you'll see some highlights that might, I don't know how it looks on the camera. It's on, on the camera that you guys see, but yeah. Um, you know, the spray paint works really well. Um, it dries really quickly um, within a couple hours. So now aren't there aren't there some spray paints you can't use because of the solvents? Good question. Um, I have not I, I haven't read that. I would not be surprised. <laughs> um, this spray paint from Krylon worked out well. Uh, but no, it gets that's probably a good point, actually. It didn't this didn't come up with this print. This print, by the way, this is um, PLA filament, um, which is, I've read one of the more easier filaments to print with. Um, and this did not dissolve under, under. I didn't have any issues with Krylon. Um, they call it chalk, but I'm not sure what, uh, I'll have to yeah. take a look at the exact. Chalk, chalk paint. paints are a big deal for people doing furniture, that's why. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. So that's, that's all I have on that. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I do in general. Now, this was uh, University of Arizona, a website there. Which website? I will put that in the chat. One second. Okay. Uh, now, I don't have yeah. quite the overview of how the software fits together. You, you stated your name, told us about several other things you printed. Uh, in the case of the uh, high profiles on the moon, the turn of the software on the University of Arizona webpage generated this SDL file for you to, you to read for your print software. Uh, with the other items you printed, how did you do the design to get the SDL file in the first place? Okay, so with um, some other items I've printed, um, for example, my own items uh, yeah. that I've designed, um, I use something called uh, uh, um, Fusion 360, which... What, 360? You, it's called Fusion 360, and that allows you to design um, items that you'd want to print, and you can export them as STL files. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for example, for like the you find your scope do cap, or sorry, do shield. Um, you know, that was actually really simple. Um, that's actually a, a really simple item to design. It's basically just a cylinder. Yeah. Um, the difficulty is in designing the cylinder at the right diameter so that when it comes out of your printer, it actually, you know, you can get a strong friction fit on your finder scope. So that yeah. actually, what I did there is I just, I basically designed cylinders that were off, you know, differently sized by like, you know. Yeah, I have something like that I want to do, yeah. So you did trial and error? Yeah, it's trial and error. And, and it's actually, that's actually really simple in the sense that um, like for something as simple as a, um, as a dew shield, you know, it's a, it's a cylinder you're taking, um, you know, I went from 57.1 to 57.2 to 57.3 millimeters. Um, I have three test prints, of just very small cylinders. They're not actually full caps or they're not actually full dew shields. They're running like 10 millimeters high. Yeah. Um, so they print out in like 20 minutes. Um, and then I test, you know, I tested yeah. which one yeah. actually okay. had a good yeah. fit. Yeah. And then when I found the one with a good, the good diameter, I printed out an entire one. So, you know, yeah. I, I went to 140 millimeters long for the dew shield and it actually works perfectly. I like it. That's um, long. Yeah. 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 And it's perfect for a 50 millimeter. It's great. It's very long. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in theory, you can, if you can measure the size you want accurately, you can also measure the size of the print accurately. So mm -hmm. you can, you can, you can check. So say if you need something that's exactly 50 millimeters across, you can check in the Fusion 360, you see that it really is 50 millimeters across. Um, but in practice, I just found it a whole lot easier to get kind of close because even with a caliper, I, you know, I'm off just enough that it, you know, until you actually fit it on. Yeah. Yeah. And like in other things that come up too, like uh, filament, you know, when it, you know, some filament will, will shrink a little more than others, um, yeah. you know, and you, the sizing you have in Fusion 360 might not quite be what comes out of the printer. Yeah. Um, so like, I know I have an issue printing threaded objects. I mean, it's not like, a, it's not a big issue. I've had some success with it, yeah. uh, but I, I basically, what I'll do is I'll do a test print of a thread. Um, okay. I know that I have to scale it down. Typically, I'll scale it down by half a percent. Uh, um, and when I do that, that actually allows the, it gives me a good fit for threaded objects. Um, uh, if I download, and, and I can download something that someone else has designed, like a thread, anyone's designed, anytime it's a threaded object, I will scale it down. Um, that's the only way that works for me. Um, and, you know, it, it may be different on a different printer too. Like it's not necessarily um it you know it depends like this is the way the printer that i bought you know behaves and i could buy the same model printer um that it might just work differently you know from what i've read like so it's not like a you know it could be where i have it in the house who knows um but uh it takes a little bit of trial and error yeah. um, but you know once you find something that 
it works, you know, you can get some pretty good consistency. Yeah. So with Fusion 360, how sophisticated does it get? Could you, with your cylinder, for instance, have an inside uh, thread? Yes. Or maybe just ridges that are a little squashable, so that when you shove it on, if it sticks, you know, you, there's some give in the rings. On the yeah, so you can, in Fusion 360, I mean, I don't know how complex it gets. Um, I've only gone up to... Um, I think the most complex thing that I designed um, really, I guess, would just be the desiccant holder for my smith grains. But, you know, that's just it, that is just basically a series of tubes uh, with holes in it. Uh, so that's not particularly complex. Uh, but you can I mean, some of the designs I've seen have been I would call them sophisticated. Um, you know, one guy um, I saw one guy he did use. I think he used Fusion 360 for it. But he created uh, an orary, um, so a functional one uh, that takes hours, um, days to print. Mm -hmm. um, but it's 3D printed. It's you know accurate. Um, it's a bunch of gears, and you added a motor um, to it, so it, it could run on its own. Um, you know, people will you know print 3D model airplanes. Um, again, these aren't the individual parts themselves aren't necessarily complex, um, but it's really how you put them together uh, and what your ultimate function is. Uh, but you know, series of you know screws and you know you can you can three D print in you can print in words. Um, I've done text before, uh, so I put text on my uh, find your scope caps, uh, telling me which cap it's for. Uh, because so for my like C9 and a quarter, my C11, my C8, I've got finder scopes for each, but they're all from the same company. So they look the same. So, but the caps themselves have the name of the telescope on it. So that way I don't actually have to uh, adjust yeah, the finder scope when I change. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. yeah. So. And Fusion 360 is free. Um, there, it's uh, available for Macintosh and PC, um, but it's. Uh, you're limited to storing 10 designs at a time um, for the free version. Um, so basically that's all you can, and you have to pay for anything more than that. But I, you know, <laughs> I just, I can store the print. Once I get something I'm happy with, I just store it on my computer and I can do that. And then I don't really need the design in 360 anymore. Um, however, I cannot go back and like redo it again or change it. Mm. Yeah. I've not found the limitation in fusion 360 to be an issue. I, I'm not, you know, I, I've, again, I just started designing in May, so I'm not, and I'm not designing anything entirely or very complex. So it's, uh, it, it's a CAD program, so it's fairly sophisticated, but the problem is the more you need, to, you have to know in order to do things. So if you know how to do things like put screws or make screws into a, a cylinder, for example, um, or even put, um, regular, um, what do you call it? Teeth mark for like uh, doing um, gears. That's all stuff you have to know how to do, uh, yeah. but it's but it's capable. Yeah, yeah. And I and I took a course. Um, took a course. Uh, there was a online course for like six or seven dollars. Uh, I forget which site I went through, uh, but it's a it's a three hour course in Fusion three hundred and sixty. Um, I didn't even sit through all of it. Uh, you, you don't have to. Uh, but basically, you know, the instructor walked you through some very like basic designs. He went from like a vacuum cleaner nozzle uh, to a comb. Um, he had a few other items where you're basically learning how to. He, he chose the items because um, those items specifically allowed you to work with different things, like a hinge, for example. He had a soap box that he uh, that he designed. Mm -hmm. Um, so you learn to use a hinge or, or to design a hinge. You learn to um, design some of the basic things you would need, like a thread, any threaded objects, you need to design a thread. Um, and so it, it shows you how to, you know, this yeah. course, again, there are plenty of them out there. Uh, but, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to slog through Fusion 360 yourself, that, that is definitely good. a way to do it. Sounds good. Yeah. 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 So my dream project, George, is not astronomical, but we have a cabin in the front range of Colorado, and it's 
in a canyon and it's a neat topography. And I would love to make a model of it. Um, what I have are the DEMs. They did, a, they did, LIDAR. they flew LIDAR over the front range. And online you can get these, you know, there's a series of tiles. I don't remember how many, but it's a pretty high quality DEM. And uh, my dream is to make a tabletop model of that. Obviously, it would be in pieces. Do you have uh, that's probably what are, too ambitious? But you know, anyways. What are the? Do you have the coordinates? Uh, not on me, and it's on another computer, and I can't even get to it right now. Okay, but I could, you know, if I have your email, I could, I could show you what, you know, what what I have, and and what you know what the website is so uh, but it's all available all that stuff is available i brought it into global mapper and then uh i think i exported i i don't know if it was stl but something compatible so okay yeah maybe i could talk to you later about that yeah no definitely um we can we can see what's possible you know um yeah yeah, it wouldn't be maybe tabletop, but that's a lot. <laughs> Definitely, you know, uh, you know, we could do something else. Maybe it'd be kind of yeah. neat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well I, have do... a, I have a uh, unusual question. The answer is going to be that no, you don't know how to do this. But I have an old computer, two thousand nine, uh, that I haven't quite thrown out. I'm not using it anymore. But it has in it uh, stereo 3D video cards to use goggles with. It was a neat technology, a little too expensive. It didn't catch on. I never found any software to use it, the capability. You know, you put on goggles and you see real 3D. Uh, now, something like uh, Fusion 360 or some sort of CAD design software uh, ought to do totally something that uses that kind of capability. Has anybody heard of it? Not kind specifically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but there are plenty of people doing things in virtual environments now. So yeah. someone solved that problem. Yeah. Um, wh whether they would be willing to take your particular example and make it into something 3D, I don't know. But. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Any more questions, folks? I don't want to cut uh, George off or anything, but. Um, Folks are ready to go. We can call it good night. Okay. Very good. Well, okay. Again, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. And um, George did put the website in the chat, but I will email it out, out to everybody too a little bit later. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Let's see.